there are no great studies out there yet. Um, but we do have uh, the question and answer period. So we are here to answer all your questions today. And I'm going to conscientiously try not to move my eyebrows as much as I normally do, because I watch one of my own videos and I basically have a whole language going on with my own eyebrows. So uh, hopefully you guys are all well. Uh, thank God the pandemic seems to be slowing down a little bit. So that's really great. And hopefully everyone has uh, weathered it well. And I'm hoping you're all looking forward to some uh, spring break with less restrictions and uh, a lot more safety. So we are open to taking some questions. I did have uh, one question asked of me that I thought I'd just uh, go ahead and answer. And that was, is it safe during pregnancy to get a massage uh, or chiropractic care and that kind of thing? So um, I, as a general rule, it's perfectly fine to get a massage. We try and avoid deep tissue massages. And nothing where it's kind of, you know, uh, very strenuous or very uh, painful. Um, and obviously stay away from your front. Same thing with chiropractic care. They can manipulate your joints. They can, uh, you know, uh, do the cracks and the pushes and the shoves and so on that are involved with chiropractic care. But uh, stay away from the front. So nothing abdominal. I have heard of some chiropractors that are willing to try and rotate a baby. That would be considered extremely unacceptable in the eyes of an obstetrician. So we would certainly not recommend that anyone's doing that. But as long as you're doing a routine stuff, um, it's your elbow, it's your shoulder, it's your knee, your hips to some extent, as long as you're being safe, uh, you should be okay. Just be cautious and no one should ever be doing anything uh, with the uterus or manipulating the abdomen or that region because that's a different layer of risk and a different level of risk. <clears throat> Any tips for IVF success with adne <clears throat> adenomyosis? Adenomyosis, yeah. Um, so actually there was a study that's coming out that I just saw the other day, which shows that uh, if you have adenomyosis, uh, you definitely are better off doing a frozen embryo transfer rather than fresh. And again, that's part of the same theory we talk about on every show where endometriosis patients should always have a frozen embryo transfer as well. Because when you're being stimulated for IVF, your estrogen levels are really quite high. And if your estrogen levels are elevated, then it's stimulating things like endometriosis and adenomyosis. And if those things are stimulated, then the chances that you are going to experience a greater degree of uh, inflammation and immune reactivity are certainly higher. And if you're getting a greater degree of immune reactivity, then you are definitely going to find that your chances are lower. So in order to simplify that or, or minimize the chances that that's going to happen, you always want to do a frozen embryo transfer where there's much lower estrogen levels and you're going to have a better success. In addition, things that will reduce the overall inflammation caused by estrogen to adenomyosis are critical. So we would advocate for doing uh, three months of Lupron and Letrozole at the same time. That's being shown clinically to be beneficial and we have a video for that. Um, so we can probably put that link up on the uh, final version of this and you can click that to watch it. And then on top of that, if you have the supplements that can help, that's really great as well. So we would recommend you use NAC, you use curcumin, which is turmeric powder, and you use coenzyme Q10. And there's a very, very recent study, just I think I saw last week, which is up and coming as well, showing that resveratrol, which is another supplement, can actually be beneficial for endometriosis patients and you can take it as just a supplement so you can use that as well and that's probably going to help with adeno if it helps with endo all right we're going to youtube mm -hmm. how long does it take to hcg to improve male fertility so that's a great question um it takes a bit of explanation so first off the simple answer to your question is sperm takes 75 to 90 days from the time you start producing it till the time it's ejaculated. So anything you do today as a male, you'll see the results of in sperm between 75 to 90 days. Now, if you're using HCG, you're probably using it to increase the count of the sperm. And that's going to take 90 days because you're not going to see anything sooner. If your issues are with motility or progression, 
you can get some benefit from vitamins and that won't take uh, 90 days because the benefit for motility can be while the sperm's already there. But for things like shape, which is morphology, and for things like the uh, count of the sperm, you definitely want to wait 75 to 90 days. And the other part of it is HCG actually only works if the male has low signal coming from the brain to the testis. So if your LH and FSH are low, HCG will be beneficial. But if your LH and FSH are normal, you probably will not see much of a benefit from doing HCG therapy. So that's important to note as well, because uh, I spoke to a couple today where they were using Clomid to try and improve the sperm. And when I asked what their hormones were, they actually didn't know. So um, I applaud them for trying the Clomid, but the problem is I didn't know if it was helping them or not. So I couldn't actually tell them if it was beneficial. So you got to make sure that you know what the hormones are because the medications may be really wonderful and helpful. Um, and they also may be of no value to you at all. So make sure you know if you're eligible for using it before you try. What are the stats, costs, and process of how fertility testing works? Um, so fertility has a whole realm of testing. Um, there's a whole range of different things that they do. So they have female testing and then they have male testing. So on the female side of things, they mainly focus on immunological testing and infectious testing. Uh, so let's take each one of those. The immunological testing is simple blood tests. And they're looking at things like T helper cell ratios. They're looking at things like HLA subtypes for the DQ alpha gene. They're looking at uh, your NK activity. Um, those are some of the things that they're looking for. So uh, all of those, they will examine through your blood and they give you these very detailed reports that tell you, you know, not only what's wrong, but whether or not it can be neutralized by things with like intralipids. And in their summary, I've asked them to give us kind of a detailed report of what they would recommend treatment wise, which they do. And it's, it's really quite good. So I'm very fond of getting their reports because they, they work well. In the infectious end of things, they're doing a vaginal swab and a collection of your menstrual blood, which you do it on your own at home. And then you send it to them and they analyze it for the DNA of various bacteria and viruses in the swab and in the menstrual blood. From that, you then know how to target specific therapies to eliminate or at least drastically reduce the infections. And by drastically reducing those infections, you're hopefully significantly improving your chances of success by replacing bad bacteria with good bacteria. Is that important? We have videos on that too. So check out the YouTube channel. And on those videos, uh, we went through the data, which shows very clearly that the vaginal microbiome and the uterine microbiome actually play a very significant role in your success. So fix the bacteria, you're going to get a better chance of pregnancy. On the male side, they have sperm DNA fragmentation testing, which is a bit far for us to use here. So we don't send our sperm DNA fragmentation to them because we just do it in-house. Um, or anywhere in Ontario for doing it in Canada. Um, and then they also have infectious testing for the sperm where they actually see if there are infections in the actual sperm. So I don't know of anybody that does that. It's very cool, but actually there's absolutely no scientific data to suggest that it makes a difference. One would imagine that it makes a huge difference because if there's bacteria in the sperm and the sperm's going in the egg, you're actually starting out life with bacteria in the embryo. So that's not a great idea, but uh, we don't actually know that that's a problem. And maybe that goes on all the time and we're just unaware. So um, the data, it needs to be developed to answer that part of the question. We have had some guys where we recommend it just to kind of get some answers, but at the moment it's like really cool information without a really great use for it. Hi, Dr. VNT. I have two questions. What are your thoughts on LDN, low dose naltrexone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, my doctor prescribed metformin for me because of age. I do not have PCOS. I am an older woman, uh, which is better for older women for a frozen DE cycle? Letrozole versus esteres. That's the wow. Okay. That was three questions. Yeah, it was big. 
Okay, metformin is easy. Um, I'm not aware of any study ever that shows that older women would benefit from metformin if they don't have PCOS. So I certainly don't use that. Um, you've piqued my interest, I'll look it up, but I'm not aware of anything that suggests that that works. Um, in terms of the letrozole or esterase, it's definitely letrozole and it has nothing to do with your age. That's true for everybody. So the less estrogen you use, the safer off you are. So that's really important. And then the first question was? LDN. Oh, low dose naltrexone. Um, there is some data showing benefit to low dose naltrexone. I should probably use that for the, uh, the, uh, the topic for next week. So there is some data that supports its use, but it's not very strong. And it's mostly actually in PCOS women. Um, I was looking through a protocol someone received from another fertility center and they had low dose naltrexone there and they were saying that it was beneficial for reducing inflammation and sensitizing you to the drugs better. But I've looked at that data. It's certainly not convincing because it's not like really solid, well done study kind of material. So maybe I'll review that for next week's topic and get back to you. But at the moment, I don't use naltrexone. Um, I haven't seen enough that's convincing me to do it. I'm 20 days in for preparing my body for healthy sperm. I stopped smoking. I okay. started folic acid, zinc, 25, metformin, vitamin C, 2,000 milligrams, selenin, vitamin D. Any other suggestions? I have three months till we try to conceive. Um, wow. There's a long list of things. So coenzyme Q10, zinc magnesium, uh, vitamin C, D, and E, all of which are good antioxidants. Um, L-arginine, L-carnitine, those are all beneficial. Uh, and um, there's millions, literally, of other ones. But uh, what we normally recommend is just take one of the combined vitamins because trying to take it separately, you actually end up spending more on each individual vitamin than you will on just buying a product from a company. And I don't really care which company you use because we don't promote one over another, but it's easier to just buy it as a bundled vitamin. It's actually cheaper to do it that way too. Um, hi, Dr. V. For MTHFR, mm -hmm. 677 and low homocysteine, mm -hmm. would you recommend Y to increase folic acid to five milligrams? or methylfolate and how much? Yeah, you're supposed to use methylfolate. You can still use the same amount, but use methylfolate and make sure that they're putting you on aspirin and heparin, um, especially if you're homozygous rather than heterozygous for the defect, because uh, you need that in order to prevent the clotting that can occur with that. So um, we take that quite seriously and we do address it for our patients. When my husband and I had our first phone call appointment with you, you asked my husband to look into my mouth to see if my <laughs> ova is visible or not. Not your curious. ova, uvula. That's why that was <laughs> um, Okay, so yeah. so um, if you can see your ova through your mouth, it's... something's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> so um, the uvula is the little dangly thing at the back of your mouth. And the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario wants us to know how difficult it would be to intubate our patients if it was ever necessary to do so. So they actually asked us to put it into our initial consult. I don't know why. So that we would have documentation of it when patients came. So now I have to ask everybody to open up their mouth and say, ah, and tell me how much of that thing they can see. So that's the only reason we do it. And it kind of, it's funny now and everybody sort of likes doing it because they think it's hilarious. But uh, we have to do it because the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario mandates that we ask it of our patients. It's for their safety. It's for your safety. If you're coming here for IVF, when we make you drowsy, um, what will frequently happen is you lose control of the muscle strength in your mouth and your tongue will slide back and it'll obstruct you. And so what we then find is your oxygen saturations can drop and we got to be able to handle that. The closer your tongue is to the roof of your mouth, the faster and more severe that occlusion is, number one. And number two, the harder it is to intubate you if we ever actually had to intubate you because patients with uh, a very short distance 
um, or what's called a high malum patty score uh, are difficult to intubate even for an expert. So in those circumstances, you wanna know in advance so that you're prepared. So when we have someone who's got a malum patty of three or a malum patty of four, our kit for intubation is actually out and ready in the event that you become too sedated and we need to deal with it. We obviously have never had that happen because we're super careful with all of our cases, but we're ready for it so that if it ever does happen, we're prepared to immediately you know, address the problem. I didn't know that. Tarek didn't know that. Uh, does topical metformin help with endometriosis or only with PCOS patients? Topical metformin? There is no topical metformin. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. uh, I've never heard of topical metformin, so um, I don't know if there is such a thing. I got to look that up now. Um, topical metformin. Um, I don't know if there's topical metformin, but we'll find out. Um, but it only helps with PCOS. Uh, everybody just hang on one second. While I look this up. Is there something wrong? You ran out of memory. No, no. I will run out of memory. Oh, there is a topical metformin. Are we good? So uh, there is apparently a topical me metformin. I, I guess it looks like they need to compound it. Um, 15th of December, 2020. I'd never heard of it before. We typically use it um, orally. I've never even seen this. So you've just opened up a whole new world for me. I'm going to check that out. We'll have to try that. Hey, Dr. V. When injecting metopure 225 milligrams, it mm -hmm. burns like crazy. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions to help lessen the burning sensation? Yep. Um, you can ice the area first, or some people prefer heating it. Either one will work. Um, you can pinch really hard. Um, that in and of itself hurts, so it takes away a bit of the sting. Um, don't go too deep. And... Are we good? Don't go too deep um, and also don't go too shallow. So any of those will work for you. Um, what male fertility improvements can help right now to improve fertility, like improving motility? Any advice for someone who's tried right now to conceive? Um, okay, so first and foremost, uh, stop any bad habits. So zero smoking, zero drinking, zero drug use, including marijuana. Number two, ejaculate frequently every day or every other day once, not like several times, but just once a day or once every other day. Um, number three, eat healthy and exercise. That's really important. And then number four, uh, keep your testicles cool. So uh, don't go in a hot tub or a jacuzzi. And if you can sit on something really cold, like frozen peas is what we normally recommend, that can be really beneficial as well. Uh, the last thing is take fertility vitamins or supplements for men um, because if you have a lot of oxidative damage, undoing the oxidative damage can actually have a very significant beneficial effect on improving your sperm quality. Hello, Dr. V and T. Uh... Tarek loves it when you guys yeah. include him. So the more V and T's you say, the better off we are. I'm doing IVF with you and officially have five frozen embryos. Oh, wow waiting for genetic tests to come back before transfer. But what are your thoughts on a 4BA, 4BB, 6BB, and 3BB for outcomes? Um, any of those would give you top-notch um, outcomes. All of those are going to be very, very good. When is the ERA test recommended, and how is the efficacy? The only time we ever recommend the ERA test is if the lining simply won't develop uh, at all, and you want to see if it's receptive or non-receptive. As far as the ERA is concerned in terms of its utility for timing when to do a transfer, it's completely useless. Their own study demonstrated that, that it's of no value. It's, it's not helpful at all. 
Dr. V, when injecting Menopure, 225 milligrams. Oh, yeah, so oh, yeah. Just had an IUI with a 29 millimeter follicle. Any chance of it working or was the follicle too big? Um, 29 is pretty large. Uh, everybody's different, but um, typically speaking, when we do our IUIs, we go with somewhere between like 19 to 21. Occasionally, it'll be a little bit bigger if you think you can get like two follicles that are close together. 29 is a bit on the large side. Uh, I would have to know the specifics of that case, but normally speaking, we're not doing it at 29 millimeters. Um, how much is fertilisis? I see that it is in Europe. Mm -hmm. How much can Canadian dollars, can all clinics order it? Um, anyone can order it. Uh, it's in euros. So we made them give our patients a special price. Um, so we tell our patients what to do to get that. But for the combined infection and immune testing, it's 1,200 euros. Is introducing 30 minutes of moderate to high exercise okay leading up to FET? Yeah, leading up to it, it is. I'm not sure I'd recommend high intensity exercise after your FET, but leading up to your FET, it would be fine. High T and Dr. V. Oh, <laughs> you're killing me, man. That's that's uh, that's a step ahead. Yeah. I can't answer it though, so I'm gonna have to send it to you. Can you please go over where in the uterus embryos should be implanted? Thanks. Um, so we generally, uh, aim for, uh, 0.75 centimeters away from the top of the uterus. The studies show that anywhere around 1.5 to 0.5 are reasonable. Um, the ASRM guidelines say one to 1.5. We shorten that a little bit, but not by much. We aim for 0.75. My doc prescribed baby aspirin and Lovenox. Why use both? Um, they work differently. And uh, baby aspirin affects platelets, but Lovenox actually affects um, the clotting factors in your blood. So it's a different mechanism completely. And sometimes you need both. Um, I'm 30 years old. Terra tuzospermia is my sperm analysis, volume 5.3 milliliters volume. Mm -hmm. Almost all parameters are fine, except the morphology. 2.5% is normal, 97.5% abnormal, 94.5% with head defects. How can I improve it? Um, okay, so ways that you can improve that uh, are um, vitamins, uh, so the fertility vitamins we talked about, um, frequent ejaculation, keeping your testicles cold, and uh, avoiding bad stuff like smoking, drinking, drug use. Um, in some guys, they need an ultrasound of the testis to see if there is a problem with issues like um, uh, varicocele or uh, you know excessive veins around the testicles. Um, or any kind of problem along those lines. If you're also obese, um, obesity can very significantly negatively impact sperm quality. So that also needs to be looked at. Uh, hi, doctor. Has acupuncture ever helped a client open blocked fallopian tubes? No, that's biologically impossible. That, that can't happen. I had five embryos not tested. One was transferred successfully. One four AA frozen failed. How many out of the three left could be viable? We we're retrieved at my 36 years old. So she's 36 and then she had five embryos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Were they genetically tested? Doesn't, doesn't matter. She said she had one of the four AA frozen that failed. So at 36, we would expect like roughly half your embryos to be abnormal and have to be normal uh, so in that circumstance you're aiming for having you know some of those five be normal like we would think two or three would be okay hopefully um so yeah i mean that's a situation where we would think there's a very high chance of success you probably just unfortunately pick the wrong embryo people get too stuck in the idea that the 4aa is the best embryo and that 
you know, a 5BB or a 5AB is not at the same or, or whatever the numbers are. Um, the best quality embryo is not necessarily the one that's genetically normal. So there are many instances where we'll send a 4AA and it'll come back being aneuploid, meaning not genetically normal. And then we'll send a 4BB and it comes back as being the genetically normal embryo and it works. So don't get stuck on the embryo quality. Uh, you know, the, the important thing is the statistics. And if you've had PGT testing, that makes all the difference. If you haven't, understand that some of your embryos will be abnormal. You may need a couple of tries before you, by chance or by luck, get to the normal one. If you decrease your BMI before the FET, does it increase success even if the embryos are from a time when your BMI was higher? Yes, absolutely yes. And that's a great question. So thank you for asking that. So if your BMI is elevated at the time of the transfer, that's a major issue because it will very significantly decrease your success rates. So even if you made the embryos when you were heavier, but you're transferring them when you're lighter, you're going to do much, much better than you would otherwise. So for sure, that's important. And, and we would strongly recommend for anyone that's struggling with their weight to do their utmost with their fertility center to optimize their health before doing the embryo transfer, not just for success, although that's a huge part of it, but for safety of the pregnancy as well. Hi, Dr. VNT. It's like so official at this point. I just wanted to say thank you, Sarah and your team at VRC, after a canceled FET in the fall due to thin lining and difficult second FET prep with lots of meds and adjustments. And after 34 days, my lining has thickened. And we're transferring my one and only euploid embryo tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you for all your diligence. Well, thank you for uh, sticking it out and for being a hero and uh, waiting until everything was right before we went ahead. So uh, awesome on you. That's great. That's really, really good. For those of you that are struggling with the thickness of your lining, um, there are lots of things that can be done for that. So we are, you know, helping our patients get there. It can take some time, which can be a struggle and, and a challenge, but we can eventually get most of the patients there. Um, we even just recently, last week, in fact, received our PRP machine. So we'll now be doing PRP for the patients that need it as well. And that seems to be very beneficial. So, Hi, Dr. V. Thoughts on natural FET for PCOS after multiple failed medicated cycles? Um, I got nothing against the natural FET. Natural FETs can work quite well. Uh, medicated FET with PCOS is kind of counterintuitive because you have high estrogen levels and then we're giving you more estrogen. So we use letrozole and in a PCOS patient, that's probably the ideal thing to do, even better than natural, but natural would be a very reasonable approach. I, I got no arguments against it. Um, I would probably say letrozole would be better, letrozole and metformin, letrozole and metformin and supplements would probably give you your best bet. Again, if weight's an issue, that has to be addressed as well. So there are a number of factors that go into making sure any FET is, is ready and is appropriate. And it's not just a matter of, hey, take this pill or take that drug or let's try natural. It's a very holistic approach that is necessary to make it work. Hey, Dr. Victory, just wondering, if you have any support groups for weight loss, I saw one of your patients mm -hmm. on Instagram have good success with PCOS and trying to lose weight. Do you know how she did it? So we actually counsel our patients about the three elements of PCOS that are critical to helping them. And then we also have resources that are helpful as well. So I'll go through the three uh, resources and then I'll tell you about, uh, or the three sort of, uh, you know, approaches, and then I'll tell you about the resources as well. So number one, most PCOS patients, not all, but most PCOS patients, we will use letrozole and metformin. And that combination helps get them regular, helps improve their metabolism, reduces cancer risks for sure. So uh, that's a very reasonable approach to things. Once you're improving your metabolism, it actually can be very helpful for your weight. Most people on metformin will lose some body fat and, and bring their weight down a little bit. Number two, we use natural supplements. So inositol, NAC, and coenzyme Q10. 
have all been proven to be useful for patients that are struggling with PCOS. So if you've got PCOS, you want to take a natural approach, those are great supplements to use. And then the third approach is a combination of healthy diet. I don't like the word diet, but a healthy diet, and it has to be split across six meals a day. So breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. So make sure you're trying that routinely and keep your calories very low, 1,300 to 1,500 maximum. And then you need muscle building exercise. So that would be uh, like HIIT training or weights. Um, going to the gym and getting on a treadmill is useless. Going for walks is useless. Don't do that. You need to do something intense. So we normally recommend P90X3 or uh, um, Focus T25. Those are great workout videos that will really help you. So you can try that. If you need more, we have a nutritionist on staff, so we'll introduce you to our nutritionist. There's a physio clinic with exercise right next to us who are our partners. So we send some of our patients there. So we have as many resources as possible to help our patients. And PCO is so common, you have to have a really robust program to help those patients because that's about 20, 25% of what we see. So we made sure we had every single possible base covered and we encourage our patients. I never tell people, I won't get you pregnant. I'll say, let's come up with a plan. Let's work together. Let's do what we need to do to get you to where getting you pregnant is easy and it's safe. And that's the best approach to things we find. Um, Tarek's making faces. Yeah, you... Are we done? It could be an early show. It, it, it's the first time I've ever seen that. Um, if you have more questions, we're always happy to take more live. This would be the first time ever we would be done this early. <laughs> so, obviously, they do. Um, with polyps in the uterus removed three times, IVF is possible. I believe if planning with IVF. Uh, if you've had polyps in your uterus and they've been removed, as long as there's no scarring in your uterus, there's no reason why you can't do anything fertility wise. So IVF would be fine. Yeah. I mean, you never want to do IVF with polyps there, um, in terms of the embryo transfer, you can do an egg retrieval, but you don't want to do an embryo transfer with the polyps there because that can be quite harmful. Uh, or reduce your chances and increase your risk of miscarriage. But if you make your embryos and you clear out the polyps and there's no scarring in the uterus, there's no reason why you can't go ahead. Do you recommend DHEA for egg quality? I do for patients that are um, uh, struggling with the uh, reserve of their ovaries. Um, I do want to clarify, I don't recommend it for egg quality. Um, we do recommend it for egg number. There is one study overall, and we reviewed it on the show, which showed that DHEA actually increased live birth. So based on that, if you have diminished ovarian reserve, we do add in the DHEA. But I'm not doing it for poor egg quality. We're doing it for women with diminished ovarian reserve. I don't think there's any data to show that the DHEA actually improves egg quality in women that don't have fertility uh, issues in terms of ovarian reserve. Uh, at our doctor's suggestion and your suggestion, we did not PG as mm -hmm. test. I'm regretting my choice. Oh, Our donor was 25. We have seven good quality embryos. Your thoughts? Um, you did the right thing. So the data is very clear that there is no benefit to doing PGT testing on donor uh, egg embryos. The chances at 25 that the embryos are abnormal would be roughly 20 to 25%. And your need to do PGT testing would be minimal because if you have seven embryos, you're anticipating that five of those are normal. Um, the chances you're going to find a normal one in doing your transfer, basically within three transfers, you're guaranteed to get a good one. So there's no reason why you, you would need to do PGT testing on those. And the one study that looked at it actually said it may even be harmful to do PGT testing on those embryos. So we don't recommend it. Do you recommend DHEA for egg quality? We asked that one. Yeah. 
How long do you take probiotics like flora before FET? 10 days. What's your approach with patients who have factor V leadin heterogeneous? Thank you so much. Um, so if you have factor five Leiden mutation, you have to take aspirin and heparin when you're trying to get pregnant and you should be doing it um, kind of either right when you're ovulating or, uh, or if you're doing an embryo transfer, we started a day or two before we're doing the embryo transfer. Um, with IUI, we would start it a couple of days after the insemination. So um, all of those are really important. What are the benefits of NAC and CoQ10 and an inositol for PCOS women? What does it do in the body? Um, basically, it helps improve metabolism, and it, they're all good insulin sensitizers. Uh, the coenzyme Q10, we're not sure, but it has more of a mitochondrial benefit. So it works on the mitochondria in your eggs, and mitochondria and eggs are critical to the energy efficiency of the eggs. So that's probably where the target is. Um, but bottom line is all three have been shown in clinical studies to improve outcomes for PCOS women. Uh, we do have a video on it. It's our PCOS natural supplements video. Um, Tarek will put a link up there. So check that out and the uh, final version of this video. And um, uh, yeah, we have all the information there about which supplements worked and which didn't. And make sure you click the like and subscribe buttons when you go on our YouTube channel. Can a non-PCO person take metformin? A non-PCO person can take metformin. I think the bigger question is why would you? There's no evidence that it's beneficial outside of the PCOS population. So um, I would be questioning the rationale behind it. But uh, if someone's read a study, I, I'm certainly willing to read that. I read a lot, but I know I haven't read everything. So if someone's using metformin in non-PCOS patients, um, I would love to see the, the rationale and the science behind it. I'm not aware of any reason why that works, but I'd love to see it. Do you have to get a cavity recheck after Sinecae removal before FET? Sinecae removal? Yeah, 1 million percent, yes. So Sinecae is when there are scars between the two walls of the uterus, the front and the back. So if you get scars between them, we can go in there with scissors and cut them and, and lift them apart. The problem is, in many instances, it'll just stick right back down together again. So would I ever do an embryo transfer without checking first? Never, because in a lot of cases, it won't be normal and you need to check. What about DHA for recurrent loss? Recurrent loss. I've never seen DHA used for recurrent loss. Um, I'll find out. Let's see uh, if we can find something there that makes sense. DHEA and recurrent loss. DHEA and recurrent pregnancy loss. Nothing that I can see going on there. Let's see, and miscarriage. Nope. Oh, uh, miscarriage rates after dehydroepiandrosterone supplementation in women with diminished ovarian reserve, a case control study. Let's take a look at that. So this is 2009. It was 15% in two different centers. Uh, they said that there was a lower rate of miscarriage in the general IVF, in the yeah, so they're saying it was lower, but it was best if you were over the age of 35. So they're saying that if you have diminished ovarian reserve and you take DHEA, it will reduce your miscarriage rates. So that's the first time I've seen that before. That's interesting. Maybe that's something else we need to review. <laughs> that's old, old data. It's done by a guy I know. He's pretty bright. Um, 
That's David Barad. So uh, there's no follow-up to that, um, but I'll take a look. I'll see if I can find more for you guys. Hi, both. I'm not sure if I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, would you recommend PRP for egg quality? No issue in qu quantity. No, there's zero evidence that it helps in egg quality. And don't forget, that's an intra ovarian injection. Um, we're not even sure if it's safe. So we're doing it into the uterus, but we're not doing it into the ovary. Yeah, not yet. So um, there, there's no data that it improves egg quality at all. There's data that shows that it can drop your FSH and increase your AMH levels a little bit, enough to get people to maybe make one or two eggs. And there's one study that shows that there's about a 8 to 11% live birth rate associated with the use of PRP intraovarian injections in women with diminished ovarian reserve. But there's nothing that shows that it improves egg quality in women that have normal ovarian reserve. So I, I would definitely not recommend that. So as soon as I made the comment about the hi both, I got a question. Hello, Dr. Victor and Tarek. <laughs> Exclamation mark. <laughs> I yep. have an umbilical hernia and need to get a laparoscopic surgery to remove endometriosis. Is it possible to perform the surgery? Thanks. Is it possible to what? Perform the surgery. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, most of the time we would just get someone to come in and fix the hernia and then go through the hole that they've created, do your surgery, and then repair the defect. So um, you need a general surgeon or a really skilled obstetrician gynecologist that knows how to deal with an umbilical hernia, but uh, that's an easy thing to fix. That's not a problem at all. Is it beneficial to reduce caffeine while trying to conceive? Um, so there's data that shows that one cup of coffee per day for men, um, one to two, is actually beneficial, and more than that is detrimental because a little bit will speed the sperm up, but too much and you kind of actually reduce blood flow. So one or two cups is good. More than that is bad. For women, there is a miscarriage risk associated with caffeine use. So we tell people to limit it to once a day. Hi, Dr. V and T. Can you shed light on causes for secondary infertility and how common it is? Why does it happen? Um, do you want to take that one? You know, <laughs> I, as I was reading it, I thought to myself, I can do this. But why does it happen to me? <laughs> so secondary infertility is when you've pre previously been pregnant and now you're struggling to conceive again. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that you delivered a baby. It just has to be that you were previously pregnant. So in the case where you have secondary infertility, the causes are actually no different than normal. Um, so in a normal circumstance, it's the guy or the girl or both. On the guy side, how many sperm are there? How many of them move, how fast do they move, and how many of them are normal or not normal. On the female side of things, it's are you making an egg? Are the sperm in the egg meeting and is everything normal inside you? Are you making good quality eggs? And then sometimes we genuinely don't know what's wrong. Um, certainly if it's secondary infertility and you've had a child, one of the common things, and I dealt with this today with one of our clients, is a lot of people just aren't having enough sex. So um, sometimes you just need to find the time to be intimate because if you're not ejaculating often enough, A, the sperm quality is terrible, and B, you're not going to get it there when you need it to be there, and that's a problem. So, um, you know, there's all sorts of different reasons, but uh, there are some that are simple and easily fixable, and some of them require us to do investigations and figure out what's wrong. You're not losing. <laughs> I think people got nervous. <laughs> and they like piled on. Stay here. All right. Um, is depot Lupron for three months fairly helpful for endo patients going for transfer? Any stats on this? So uh, depo Lupron with Letrozole together is thought to be beneficial for endo patients. And there's a study we reviewed on the show which showed that if you use Lupron and Letrozole together for three months in patients with unexplained failures, that their success rates drastically improved. And the theory was that most of those patients had endo 
and that's why they were seeing the improvement in that group. So we don't have hard data, but it looks like it's um, entirely reasonable. And and you can see that also on our YouTube channel. I don't, I have, um, it's the Letrozole, God, I got it. Oh, Letrozole, okay, I'll get it. No, it's it's Letrozole and Lupron together. Oh, I saw, I know that one, I'm just not thinking. What are the benefits of acupuncture during the egg retrieval and IVF process? Is acupuncture backed by science? Yeah, so um, there are studies that support the use of acupuncture. And the question really is, um, you know, when is it helpful? Where is it helpful? And so on. So it's one of those things that very much needs to be individualized. Um, so, you know, we would definitely recommend that you um, speak to a traditional Chinese medicine specialist or your naturopath uh, to get information on how it's going to benefit you. So um, in Toronto, we use Mary Wong. She's amazing. I love Mary. Uh, she's a, a great uh, resource. Um, uh, here in Windsor, we use Jennifer Strong, our amazing naturopath. And we have Dr. Laura Jasmine in our Sarnia clinic. Um, and we're going to open up another clinic very soon. So when we open up that one, we'll find someone in that new community too. So we try and find really great um, teammates and get them to do it. Uh, there is data that supports um, the timing being critical. In fact, I think it was this morning, actually, someone was messaging me saying that they had data showing that if you don't do it in the same clinic on the day of the embryo transfer, that it's actually detrimental. So there are some interesting things like that. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I felt that needed an answer from you. Any insight to drastic sperm fluctuations and what could cause this? Generally on the lower end, but has recently dropped to 900K after a wash down from 17 mil wash less than a year ago. COVID. <laughs> COVID? Blame you think COVID. It, you blame COVID? Tarek wants to blame COVID. Um, I don't know. I mean, there could be a million different reasons. Testicular failure, varicocele, bad habits, weight gain, lack of exercise, low vitamin intake. Um, there are all sorts of potential causes. So you got to kind of look at what the specifics are and figure it out from there. Um, I don't know necessarily that I have one answer for you, um, but any of those could cause fluctuations. Um, probably number one would be bad habits. So smoking, drinking, drug use, depending on your exposure frequency and intensity could very much make the quality change. Hey, Dr. Victory, what day in your cycle do you take medroxy to induce a cycle? Um, so we ask our patients to wait 35 days from their last period. And if you have not had uh, the um, uh, period by 35 days, do a pregnancy test. And then once you've done the pregnancy test, if it's negative, take the medroxy for 10 days. Is it normal to have light bleeding and cramping two weeks after positive HCG test? Um, it's never normal. It's relatively common, but it's never normal. And you need to take any bleeding in pregnancy seriously. So ectopic precautions, close monitoring, you gotta you know, always follow up with your doctor, make sure everything's okay. Um, so we'll do serial beta HCGs, we'll do early ultrasound. Um, you need to be examined, make sure there's no pain on one side or the other where we would worry about an ectopic. So all of those are, are really, really important for you. There is a fitness movement called icing testicles. Using frozen peas three times a day for some time, they report 30% testosterone increase. Could this improve fertility? Yeah, for sure. We tell people to do this all the time. I, I think I probably pioneered the frozen peas thing. Yeah. Say, don't eat it. Yeah. And then I tell everyone, just don't feed them to anyone but your enemies. So, um, yeah, I mean, it definitely improves fertility. We talk about it every show, right? Every show. Every show. Yeah. So frozen peas, every show. Um, sit on frozen peas 
uh, and it'll improve your sperm quality for sure. So no frozen peas, no carb heater. No, yes to frozen peas. Yes, frozen peas. No to call it car heater. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Keep it cool. Mm -hmm. uh, is flora taken vaginally or orally? Is flora the vaginal. name of the brand? Yeah, I think the brand is NFH, I think. And the product is called Flora. So um, that's the one that we use, and it, it works really well. My doctor recommended metformin due to my age and for upcoming FET. Not sure why. Again, I'm not aware of anything that says that metformin improves egg quality, um, but that's another one we're going to need to look up. I can probably look that one up too. I'm going to be looking up lots tonight. How many days after transfer is it okay to pick up my 28 pound? Pound? Yeah, toddler. Is bending over also an issue? Um, you know, literally the next day you can because the embryo is either attached or it isn't. But uh, we generally try and tell you to avoid heavy lifting and straining um, for a while after an embryo transfer. Uh, so if your toddler is 28 and it's a toddler, um, don't bend down and pick them up. Sit down and let them come to you and you can lift them from a sitting position. But don't be bending down at your back and lifting because that's a lot of core exercise. Um, and you shouldn't be doing that. How common is sperm DNA fragmentation in cases of RIF? Very common. So if you have high sperm DNA fragmentation, your chances of having a miscarriage are um, over a thousand percent higher. So that can be why you're recurrently failing to implant or recurrently miscarrying. That's really important. Prengonal F for the first time for medicated IUI. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions to achieve optimum results? Oh, God. Uh, eat healthy, exercise, keep your stress levels low, make sure your vitamins are up to date and at the right levels. Take all the supplements. Um, don't overdo it with the gonal F because you can produce too many eggs. Um, yeah, there's loads of stuff that goes into that. Have you ever seen severe low motility and count with no veras varicocele ever improved? Yeah, all the time. Cold therapy, vitamins, avoid the bad stuff. Sperm is actually quite amenable to improving. Um, so it depends on how severe it is and what the problems are. But if you take a guy on average and you make him do all the healthy stuff, the sperm will often improve. I'm not going to say it's universal because it isn't, but it'll often improve. And, and we've seen very, very impressive improvements, sometimes enough that they don't even need us. They get pregnant just while they're improving the sperm. Are Kegel safe to do the first trimester? Yeah, Kegels are harmless at any point in time, always. Do you only do scheduled C-sections on a specific day of the week? Uh, no, I do C-sections whenever they give us time to do them. The only day of the week it's tough is Wednesdays because I'm usually in the OR, although that was pre-pandemic. Do you have a clinic in the USA or can you recommend one? Um, I don't have a clinic yet in the USA. We're working on it. Um, recommend one. I haven't quite yet found a clinic in the U S that I trust hundred percent, although there are individuals that I trust in the U S. So the one I probably trust the most is, uh, Eve Feinberg in Chicago. She is amazing. She's at Northwestern and, um, she's the best of the best. If you have been diagnosed with DUR and miss your period, what could that mean? What should... If you've been I diagnosed mean? with DUR mm -hmm. and you missed your period, mm -hmm. well, you could be pregnant, uh, you could have just had a bad cycle, or you're approaching menopause and your ovaries are not working well. I'm taking pregnant five prenatal. Mm -hmm. Are there any supplements I should still take in addition besides NAC and also vitamin D, metformin, Melatonin, 29, PCOS, two failed FETs. Should I take vitamin E or omega-3? So she's on NAC, inositol, metformin? Vitamin D, metformin, melatonin, PCOS, yeah. 
Uh, coenzyme Q10, NAC and Ocetol. Um, vitamin D is good. Melatonin is great. Um, Omega-3 fish oils. As far as supplements are concerned, those are the same ones we use. Is having a jacket in the vagina uterus okay the evening before the day or even soon after the FET? What about an orgasm? Um, the day before is fine. Um, it might even be beneficial. Uh, certainly two days before would be totally reasonable and sooner than that is great. We encourage that. Um, the day of, I probably wouldn't do only because of the fact that you don't want to rock the boat. And it's kind of hard to not rock the boat um, if you're having sex right after an embryo transfer. So I wouldn't do it right after an embryo transfer. Um, I'd probably wait a couple days and then you're fine right after that. Can you suggest a proven to be good male fertility all in one supplement, bread and product? Um, so we as physicians in Canada can't recommend or endorse one over another. I can just tell you the one we use because we have access to it. Um, is Pro Fertile and Fertile Pro. Um, Fertile Pro is Canadian. We've had very good luck with it and I like the product. Um, not that I'm saying it's better than any other product or I endorse it over any other product. It's just a reasonable product. Um, Pro Fertile does have actual scientific data supporting the use of the product. And so that's actually a, a great option for people um, because I can actually hand them a study saying, look, they actually did the research and it's Health Canada approved for improving sperm. Um, none of the other vitamins actually have that. So ProFertile was a, a very reasonable choice just because there's science behind the claims. Can you casually drink while trying to conceive? Can you? Yes. Should you? No. Alcohol is toxic to all tissues and it's particularly bad for fertility. So I wouldn't do that. Hi, thank you both. What do you test for NK cells and how does it impact RPL? And how did my AMH level double in one year? Um, okay, I'll take the easier of those two questions. You can test for NK cells in your bloodstream or biopsy samples, so that's easy. Um, how does it impact? If you have too high a level of NK cells, they're basically attacking your embryos or making the environment unfriendly to implantation. If you have um, uh, a lot of NK cell activity, there are ways to modify it and correct it. And so those are things we need to investigate and then address. And there's different testing modalities and there's different treatment modalities as well. The second part was... Uh, how did my Amy so double oh, one year? I have no idea what you did, but if it genuinely doubled in one year, um, I think every single person watching and me as well would love to know. I mean, if you went from one to two or two to four, that's probably just error in the machine reading. But if you went from 10 to 20, um, something is bizarre there. So uh, that needs to be looked at. We have had patients that were on long-term birth control and had low AMH levels. And then we pulled them off the birth control and they actually did quite well and produced lots of eggs. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I know a physician that actually did that. So, um, you know, sometimes there can be suppressive reasons for the AMH. And if you were suppressed, it could be stress or eating disorder or anything that may be part of the problem. How long is your wait list for new patients? It depends. We tend to triage people based on the severity of the need. Um, so if it's pretty low key and it's not urgent, um, it, you know, can take longer. And if it's urgent, sometimes we see you the same week. Um, if you have cancer, I'll see you the same day. So it all depends on what's going on with the patients. Um, I've been strictly forbidden from putting timelines on things because the office staff will kill me. So Mara, if you're watching, you can't get angry at me. Um, but we try and get people in as quickly as possible. And if you need... Uh, you know, something expedited, you can certainly plead your case to me and I will forward it to the powers that be and they will judiciously decide how quickly we can see you. Can you frozen embryo transfer after one week negative for COVID-19? In other words, you had COVID-19 and a week after you 
tested negative, you want to get your embryo transfer, there's no way I would let my patients do that. You need to wait like two months, in my opinion. Um, so I would wait because mm -hmm. your immune system is still very active, producing antibodies and recovering. That's the wrong time to do an embryo transfer. Um, this time, would you agree we are skipping PGTA? Is there a second part to that question? <laughs> uh, I don't have the rest of that question, so I can't answer. And it's nine. Me either, me either. Okay. Yeah, and Tarek doesn't either. Anything else? We'll end it with an advice question. Okay. Hello, Dr. V and Tarek. Oh, this team. I think I got a smiley face after that. You got a smiley face. Smiley Tarek. Yeah. Do you have any advice for a couple who have lost the spark in intercourse after years of trying to conceive? It just feels like a chore now. Um, I have lots of options for you. So uh, number one, forget fertility completely and just be intimate with one another. So um, a lot of times that can be very beneficial to your relationship and to your sex life. Number two, communication is key for sexual function. So if you're telling each other what you like and what you don't like, it's a much better experience than if it's all silent. Um, number three, if you're on the guy side of things, um, women uh, are not necessarily the same as men. And if you're on the female side of things, uh, men are definitely not the same as women. So there are wants and desires from both sides that tend to run in kind of line with one another for both sexes. But um, there are differences. And in general, guys are more into the um, physical aspects of sex and women are uh, probably attuned more to the emotional parts of it. So guys, if you're not attuned to the emotional part of what she's experiencing, it's not going to be as good an experience for her and vice versa from the women to the men. That's certainly not true for anybody. I'm not trying to overgeneralize, but there are studies that support the fact that that's kind of the way it's looked at in general. And then some people need to um, liven or freshen things up. So uh, I'll frequently recommend people go to an adult store and find something they want to try together. Um, there are cases where porn can be helpful, not the crazy stuff you see um, out there these days, but there's actually like romantic porn that's, um, what did one of my colleagues call it once? Uh, she had a special term for it. It wasn't romantic porn. It was not professional. Oh, I, I can't remember the exact term, but anyways, she had a, a term where it was, you know, respectful. People aren't being smacked and beaten and things like that. It's not vile or violent. Um, it was, you know, very reasonable, um, more lovemaking than porn for that matter. Um, sometimes you need that. Sometimes it's lingerie. Sometimes it's, you know, do something romantic. Um, in many cases for the guys, it's pick your socks up off the floor, clean up a little bit, you know, um, shave, don't drink, don't smoke. All of that stuff can be really important. So those are you some of the features. See Tarek with a vacuum. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of it's emotional. Um, and and just communication is huge so you know talk and and sometimes um you know you can have lead-ins so a massage can really help or spending time in a bath together can help or um you know taking a walk and holding hands like you know with women being more attuned to the emotional part sometimes they just want to cuddle and that's okay um so you know be attuned to that if you're a guy and if you're a woman remember that um, you know, hopefully your guy loves you and, and wants to be intimate with you because he loves you. So sometimes it's just about recognizing each other's wants and needs and, and uh, you know, going with that. Um, I do have a ton of information prepared to put a video together. I just don't have any time to put a video together, but we will endeavor to do that shortly so we can have something for you guys, literally all about sex when you're trying to conceive. Okay, I don't know yeah, it's 9 to 5. All right, guys, have a wonderful week. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the show. We will see you again next week on Fertility Fact or Fiction. And I think we have another little closing video, do we? Do we have a closing music or a tune? Or You can give me a little something. <laughs>